All right, well, thank you very much for that. And I'm glad to see that you were all suitably intimidated <laughs> by my presence. So um, we did have some technical difficulties getting my slides up and running. So I will need to read a bit more from my presentation tonight than I maybe had intended. So keep an eye on the person next to you. And if they look like they're drifting off at any point, just give them a little poke. Um, and I also want to say a little bit, this is an interesting project for me. This was my first um, kind of attempt to think deeply about some of the questions that are raised by plasticity and post-humanism, which we'll be talking about a little bit later in the lecture, uh, and kind of wrestling with those in the, uh, kind of as they relate to my interest in theological anthropology around what does it mean to be human, and here what does it mean to define what it means to be human. Uh, and so I'll just let you know, this was a weird project, and it's one of those, I don't know if you've ever had an experience writing a paper, where you kind of start out assuming that your paper's going this way, and the more you work on the paper, the more it kind of, and then you end up over here by the time that you're done, and you're like, huh, I'm not sure how I ended up over here exactly. Um, and I've talked with a couple of groups about where I've ended up, and I haven't had anybody yet explain to me why I shouldn't have ended up over here. So I'm counting on you all. My fate is in your hands. I need somebody to help me figure out why this might not be the best place uh, at the end of the day. So we'll get into it. Then uh, I'll go home and you will have me straightened out. I did not realize until relatively late in my theological development that I had a rather fundamental ambiguity in my, uh, my understanding, my thinking about what it means to be human. See, on the one hand, I'm a bit of a science fiction fantasy nerd. So I grew up reading books and watching movies that are filled with wonderfully imaginative proposals for how weird humans are. Right, you've got all kinds of stories about like cybernetic organisms and half human, half machine things. Uh, or if you go back further, you have stories about hybrid creatures like the Minotaur. So you've got a half human, half bull and then you're kind of wondering exactly how that happened, and then you move on without thinking about it too much. Um, or stories about like artificial intelligence or uploading minds to machines and whatnot. And all of these stories, what they have in common is they have a desire to play a bit with our understanding of what it means to be human. They want to stretch our imaginations and force us to wrestle with the question of maybe humanity, the very essence of what it means to be human, is stranger than we thought that it was. Maybe there's more that can be contained within the concept of the human than we anticipated. So on the one hand, I've got all of these stories and things kind of challenging and stretching my imagination about what it means to be human and playing in this wonderful world of how weird humanity is. But then I've actually got a whole nother side to me where I grow up in a tradition where actually the human is relatively obvious. It's not difficult to know what it means to be human viewed from another perspective. I read the, uh, the Bible. In the beginning, God created humans, and he apparently created like hamsters and barracuda. And nobody's terribly like worried trying to figure out, well, is that a human or a hamster? Right? It's just obvious. As I'm walking down the street, I'm not wrestling with questions about what it means to be human. I see it, somebody walking their dog. I know that's the human and that's the dog. And you can dress the dog in as many like little cutesy outfits as you want with little bootsies, and I still know that it's a dog. You can make my phone as smart as you want it to be, but I'm not wrestling with the question of, is my phone human? So I have a whole other side to my life where the, 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 uh, the concept of the human is easy and obvious. And growing up, we knew there were questions about like the beginning of human life, like when does human life start and the end of human life. But in between, the human was not a difficult concept. And I had this really weird juxtaposition of ideas going on, where on the one hand, the idea of the human was mysterious and complex and elastic. And on the other hand, the idea of the human was pretty straightforward and easy and obvious. And I had never really wrestled with the fact that I didn't know how to fit those two things together and what I should do with that exactly. <clears throat> Now, you might be inclined to dismiss all of this as the inevitable clash of a fantasy world created by authors and movie makers who have way too much time and money on their hands and the world of everyday life. But I want us to consider tonight the possibility that there's a similar tension at work. 
in our Christian imaginations now regarding what it means to be human. And unless we identify that tension and begin to think through its implications with greater rigor, I think it's one that has the potential to cause us some problems as we begin to think about questions that are raised in modern discourse about the human. Now, to see what I have in mind, we're going to think together tonight about the idea of the plasticity of the human person. And we're going to engage that concept in conversation with a, a loosely affiliated group of thinkers that I already mentioned, known as the post-humanists. To do this, we're going to do four things. First, we're going to talk a little bit about what the, the words plasticity and post-humanism mean. Try to unpack those a little bit more and begin to get a feel for some of the intuitions that lead people to think that it's a good idea to talk about humans as plastic or the idea of the post-human. Then second, we're going to tease out a set of Christian intuitions that people have put forward suggesting that that's a terrible way to think about what it means to be human. Right, so first it's going to be, what does it mean to think about humans as plastic and what is the post-human? Second, it's going to be, why have Christians and a number of prominent Christian theologians been so strident in their criticisms of plasticity and post-humanism? What are the theological intuitions leading them to believe that this is a terrible way to do things? But third, and this is where things are going to get a little bit interesting, they did for me, is we're going to tease out a different set of Christian theological intuitions. And we're going to talk about a different way of imagining what it means to be human within the context of Christian theology that's going to suggest that there might be a different way of engaging the issues than we saw with the first set of theological intuitions. That's the kind of tension in the Christian imagination that I had in mind. And then finally, we're going to say, if that second set of theological intuitions is right, we're going to address a problem that it creates for how we think about what it means to flourish as a human person. So if we have tensions with our own theological imaginations about what it means to be human, how do we then go on to talk about what it means to flourish as a human? Okay. So that's kind of our, our map for this evening. So first, plasticity and posthumanism. People use our first term, plasticity, in a variety of contexts to note the idea that some material object is sufficiently malleable to undergo at least certain kinds of changes while remaining, in at least some ways, a member of the same class of objects that it was prior to the change. I'll say that one more time because it's not on the screen behind me. Plasticity, plasticity is the idea that some material object is sufficiently malleable to undergo at least certain kinds of changes while remaining, in at least some ways, a member of the same class of objects that it was prior to the change. To give you an idea of what we have in mind here, when I was growing up, we loved to play with those little green plastic army men, like the really cheap ones you get like in big bags and whatnot. And when I say play with them, what I actually mean is that our favorite thing to do is to get as many of those together as we could, find somebody who for some unfathomable reason had access to a lighter, and heat up those little plastic figures so that you could like reshape them and morph them into like twisted Dr. Seussy looking like things. That's plasticity. Now, of course it is because they're made out of plastic. But you get the idea, right? They still looked kind of like plastic army men. They're, they were still recognizably members of the same class that they were beforehand. They didn't become like not army men. They didn't become like eagles. We weren't artistic enough for that. They just became like weirdly elongated and stretched and morphed plastic army men. Now, if we got super horribly bored, which was also not unusual, and we uh, use that lighter to create basically green globs of goo. We have still transformed those army men, but in a way that no longer looks merely transformative, but now actually destructive. They're no longer army men. And now we've moved beyond the range of what is usually contained within the concept of plasticity. Uh, and the idea that there is an ambiguous line between transformation and destruction is one of the issues that's going to kind of chase us for the rest of the evening and trying to figure out within the concept of plasticity when we move from the concept of transformation to the concept of destruction. <clears throat> now, although the term has been around for quite some time, the idea of plasticity 
really seems to get kind of traction in modern talk about what it means to be human uh, through the idea of neuroplasticity, right? the idea that our brains are malleable, that they get shaped by our experiences. Uh, so the older idea that we're kind of, uh, when we're born, our brains are kind of already set um, and that uh, they almost deterministically kind of deter uh, shape who we're going to be and the kinds of things that we're going to do. That's largely been overturned. We, we now kind of build off the idea that our brains are plastic um, and my personality gets shaped over time by my experiences. Um, uh, so that in a very r real sense, actually the very physical nature of my brain is taking on a different, uh, different set of contours as I go throughout experience. That's the idea of plasticity. And if we take that concept of neuroplasticity, that my brain's malleable and is shaped by my experiences, and if we combine it with the modern idea that our brains are pretty fundamental and central to who I am as a human person, uh, right? We, we really emphasize that my brain almost contains the essence of myself. Uh, so that I can cut off my arm and I'm probably gonna be okay if I cut off my brain, myself has a real problem here, right? But if my brain is plastic, and if my brain is central for being who I am, then it shouldn't surprise us that the idea of plasticity begins to kind of bleed over into almost every aspect of human existence. And so lots of things that we used to think of as relatively stable uh, uh, aspects of human identity, think in terms of my, my sexed body, my racial identity, um, uh, my personality, things that we used to think of were relatively stable and fixed, we now think of as very uh, plastic shapeable and malleable. <clears throat> Our second term, post-humanism, is a bit more difficult to define. And it might help a bit if we actually start with the related term transhumanism, which is commonly defined as a class of philosophies of life that seek the continuation and acceleration of the evolution of intelligent life beyond its currently human form and human limitations by means of science and technology guided by life-promoting principles and values. All right, so the idea behind transhumanism, it's, and, and, and the, the, the idea there that it's a class of philosophies is intentional. Um, it's actually hard to, deter, to define because it's not a single movement, but it's a group of people who say, all right, we're plastic people. We know that our technologies are um, at least one of the many ways in which we get shaped as human persons. Therefore, we have the responsibility as well as the opportunity to use those technologies intentionally and purposefully to guide the plastic development of the human person towards some end that is guided by life-promoting principles and values. That comes from the transhumanist back FAQ online. So they'll move from rather innocuous examples of technological enhancement, things like LASIK surgery, artificial limbs, pacemakers, right? Things that we tend to accept as relatively innocuous examples of the technological transformation of human individual. Uh, and then they'll extend the logic out and begin to craft greater thought experiments about cyborg organisms and the possibility of even uploading the human consciousness onto um, a uh, supercomputer network of some kind, uh, with the idea being that that's simply the logical extension of the kinds of things that we're already doing, which are themselves just kind of building out of this logic that we're developmental creatures, technology shapes us, so let's do it wisely and intentionally and purposefully uh, along the way. So that's transhumanism. <clears throat> Post-humanism, on the other hand, so if transhumanism really focuses on the process of using technology to develop persons in some future-oriented direction, post-humanism is often described as something that focuses more on the result. What is it that we're producing as we work through this transhumanistic process? Uh, so that the idea being that at some point in time we may arrive at a state where it's no longer unambiguously the case that whatever it is that results from this transhumanist process is still human, whatever we mean by that. So post-human is just trying to capture this intuition that whatever we're moving toward may no longer be unambiguously human. <clears throat> so using one common statement, possible future, human, uh, possible future beings whose capacities so radically exceed those of present humans as to be no longer unambiguously human by current standards. So it's possible to think of post-humanism and transhumanism as kind of two sides of the same coin, with transhumanism being more about process, 
post-humanism being more about result. I will let you know that if you get super interested in this and you dig into the literature more, you'll find that there are a bunch of post-humanists who actually don't like that way of defining what post-humanism is actually about because it doesn't sound to them radical enough. Uh, and they'll often talk about the transhumanism is still captured by basic humanist commitments to the unique significance of the human person. So transhumanists still kind of retain the idea that humans are uniquely significant in the world, and then their focus is how to get these really cool, unique human creatures to be even more cool and unique through this transformative process. Many posthumanists think that actually the, the goal here should be to recognize that humans are embedded in larger evolutionary processes uh, and that we should really surrender the idea that we are as uniquely cool and significant as we think that we are. Uh, and so many posthumanists have as one of their goals to break down some of the uh, distinguishing borders that we draw between the human and the non-human, the human and the machine. Uh, they're looking for kind of a more all-encompassing move here. <clears throat> For the purposes of the rest of this lecture, I'm going to focus more on those who are content with the first set of definitions. Transhumanism is about the process. Posthumanism is about the result, uh, where we envision the possibility of this process is going somewhere, where the end result is something that's hard to call human. It's at least no longer unambiguously human at the end of the day. <clears throat> um, so throughout it all, the basic impulse behind both transhumanism and posthumanism is the plasticity of the human person. Pushing beyond the modest claims of neuroplasticity, proponents of these views maintain that humans can and probably should. There's often an ethical responsibility component to this. Um, and almost uncertainly, unavoidably will utilize existing and future technologies in ways that will challenge the limitations of humanity, including things like the body, space, time, and death. We'll get into all of those in a moment. <clears throat> all right, so that's part one. Plasticity, post-humanism, why are people saying these kinds of things? What's motivating it? Section number two, then, is why have Christians often rejected these, which I originally titled as post-humanists or heretics? So with this basic summary in place, it should give us the, uh, kind of enough resources to get a feel for three basic worries that Christians have raised. Uh, and I'm going to move in pretty broad strokes here. But three basic worries that, that, that Christians have raised regarding this way of understanding what it means to be human. Uh, two of them revolving around explicit heresies. So un almost certainly the most common of these worries is the idea that post-humanism entails a form of Gnosticism. Right, where we understand Gnosticism uh, in a really broad sense. I don't know if you're familiar with, um, uh, historically, Gnosticism is notoriously difficult to pin down what that term actually means. Um, if you're not interested in history, then you don't care. You just use the term anyway, which is what theologians do. So we like to use the term Gnosticism all the time. Um, and what we mean by that often is just broadly any view that, that downplays or denigrates the goodness of creation as a material realm created by God as the good creator. So it's, it's either going to denigrate the material realm, view it as uh, sometimes evil, often more just like not as good. Right? You've got a hierarchy where the spiritual realm is good, the material realm is at least not as good. Possibly the material realm is evil, that's one option. Um, or anything that's going to kind of distance the creator from the creation uh, so that um, God is pure good and he has to be kind of uh, mediated in his relationship to creation because of the not as goodness nature of creation. So the worry here being that post-humanism in some sense entails a form of Gnosticism. And it's not hard to see why that might be the case given that post-humanism calls for us to, quote, transcend the limitations of the human condition. If the human condition is supposed to be good, why would we need to transcend it? So that very intent to transcend the human condition to many suggests post-humanism. So that for many posthumanists, overcoming the temporal limitations provided by aging and death constitutes the fundamental goal of the posthumanist agenda. <clears throat> and given that many posthumanists focus on the mind as the locus of human identity, thus exploring uh, various thought scenarios in which we can like, transplant our minds or upload them or whatnot, then they begin to explore the possibility that we can transcend even the limitations of space and time. 
right, if I can upload my mind into a machine, now I can be everywhere and uh, at all times and places and whatnot. So it begins to look like an agenda where the very purpose is to overcome most of the things that we think of as intrinsic to the created order, right? physicality, uh, spatiality, temporality, fundamental aspects of human existence like that. <clears throat> So one famous quote uh, uh, from uh, post-humanist literature is, people of the world unite, you have nothing to lose but your biological chains. Now it's difficult to hear anything like that as involving anything less than a clear challenge to the Christian commitment to the goodness of the created order. <clears throat> and indeed, many of the post-humanist claims seem to be precisely the kinds of things that early Christians were so intent in refuting in their um, uh, interactions with people like those that we label as the Gnostics. <clears throat> so the early form of the doctrine of creation was specifically there to push back against the idea that the created order and the human person's role in the created order was something to be rejected or corrected, uh, that we should actually celebrate the goodness of the body. And yes, we live in a fallen world, but it's still a world created by the good God who declared it all to be good at the end of the day. And we still find ourselves in a story uh, that is going to climax in the goodness of the resurrected body in the new earth and where the, the, the pinnacle of this is the resurrection where God himself comes in human form. So most of the early part of Christian theology is explicitly uh, developed in response to these kinds of ideas in rejecting. So that if post-humanism entails this kind of incipient Gnosticism, we have a rather robust and necessary set of Christian intuitions that suggest we should get rid of it. Michael Heim thus warns that the posthumanist vision for the future could easily become a Gnostic and Manichaean inferno, whose inhabitants loathe the very existential features that anchor humans to the real world. And Brent Water speaks for many when he eschews the posthumanist vision as a Gnostic escape or liberation from material constraints. So, posthumanists appear to be Gnostics or heretics because they sure look a lot like Gnostics. On the other hand, they look like heretics because they sure look a lot like Pelagians. The second heretical worry that's often identified here is that post-humanism post entails an incipient form of Pelagianism. To see why, we first need to appreciate the parallels between the post-humanist vision of the future and Christian ideas of salvation. Right? If the whole goal of the post-humanist vision, like this, this technological transformation of the human person towards some future end, that future end involves things like um, uh, ongoing life, health, um, uh, uh, transcending the debilitating conditions of the fallen world in which we find ourselves. But notice that they don't envision this future as something that they will receive as a gift of God's grace at the end of times. Instead, the eschatological vision of the future they have in mind is something that we achieve through the application of the right technological means guided by the right values and goods. Well, if that's the case, then we seem to have a vision of the world in which we accomplish salvation through the right application of human effort, which is the position we traditionally associate with Pelagianism. <clears throat> So once again, Brent Waters associates posthumanism with the, quote, the Pelagian conceit of an ability to perfect or transform ourselves. So on the one hand, they're heretics because they're Gnostics. On the other hand, they're heretics because they're Pelagians. The third one's not as much fun because we don't have a handy heretical label to kind of hang on it. But the worry here is that posthumanism leaves us without any ability to say what humans actually are. I'm just calling this one the definition worry. So our third worry is, according to this account, we can't say what humans are. <clears throat> All right, so posthumanism maintains uh, as its goal that humanity moves beyond its currently human form and human limitations so that we arrive at a state that is right, no longer unambiguously human by our current standards. And although we could view this as just a statement about the future, it has epistemological implications for the present. Because the idea being that um, if we have no idea what humans are capable of transforming into, it makes it actually rather difficult to say anything definitive about what humans are now. Right? So that uh, if I want to say, and I don't want to say, but if I want to say Will's not human and I am human, 
then I need to have some kind of delineable set of something, some properties or potentialities or a telos or something that allows me to say not human, human. Or if I want to go human, human, not human. Right? I have to have something in the mix here that allows me to make those kinds of moves. But if it's basically impossible to say what it is that humans can transform into, it becomes relatively difficult for me to say that. Right? So that if I say, Will's not human, I'm human, Will can just say, oh no, I'm the kind of human that you just haven't arrived at yet. I'm like, oh, I didn't see that coming. Right? And so we seem on this account to have undermined our very ability to talk about what it means to be human. Uh, and there's a big long quote here that I'm going to skip because you don't get to see it, where somebody says what I just said. All right, then the definitional worry also seems to press up against some pretty fundamental theological commitments where we do think it to be the case that we know at least something and actually some rather important things about what it means to be human. So typically we start with the image of God, uh, even though there are lots of debates about the specific contours of the image of God and what kind of conceptual content we should provide that. We think that there is something substantive about the fact that humans are made in the image of God and other creatures are not said to be made in the image of God. So at the beginning of the story, we have an important kind of theological commitment to the idea that, that, that it is possible to talk about a distinguishing feature, uh, a, a distinguishing theological claim that allows us to differentiate human from non-human. If that wasn't the case, it would seem difficult to make the kinds of even incarnational claims that we make in the New Testament, where God becomes human. According to Hebrews, it seems rather important that he become like us in every way. But if, on the posthumanist account, it's impossible to say what it means to be human, then we seem to kind of rob that incarnational claim of any real significant value. Uh, it seems to, to say no more than divine became creature. But our intuitions suggest more than that. We want to say there's something significant, not just that the word became flesh, John 1, but that the son became like us in every way. Uh, so that he could call us brothers and sisters, Hebrews 2. So we have image of God logic. We have um, incarnation logic. The Christian narrative of salvation for many people suggests, even if we want to, to say that the Christian narrative of salvation should be broad enough to include the redemption of the whole cosmos, the way the narrative gets unpacked in the Bible does seem to highlight the significance of the human person along in that once again suggesting that we have kind of gospel reasons for thinking that humans are identifiably significant in the story. So for many Christian theologians then, even if posthumanism might be a valuable dialogue partner for probing on some interesting issues and raising questions about technology um, and making us think about the future in ways that we might not have otherwise, on this set of theological intuitions, the, this plasticity and posthumanist vision of the human person is fundamentally flawed because it inevitably or at least implicitly involves us in a Gnostic understanding of creation, a Pelagian vision of salvation, um, and the impossibility of defining and therefore distinguishing humans from the rest of creation. <clears throat> Which would seem to suggest that we should probably stop talking about posthumanism now and just have extra time for like refreshments and whatnot. But we have a third section. Section three, so if section two was Pelagians or heretics, no, sorry, uh, posthumanists or heretics, section three, I decided the title was, Oops, We're Heretics Too. Okay. So what I want to do here is I want to walk through the same three concerns that we just did, Gnosticism, Pelagianism, and the definitional worry. But I want to apply a different set of theological intuitions, ones that are also deeply ingrained in the history of Christian reflection on these issues but lead us to a different set of conclusions that may ask us to revisit how we're thinking through these kinds of issues. So let's take the Gnostic worry first. Now, just to be clear, I have absolutely no intention of arguing that there's a way in which Gnosticism is actually not that bad, and we should just embrace Gnosticism. Okay. No, that's not the solution that we're going to uh, propose here. Instead, I want to explore a set of theological intuitions that raise many of the same issues that posthumanism does, but without 
obviously leading to the conclusion that there is Gnosticism lurking in the background. So what might those be? Well, first we should recognize that an increasing number of modern theologians seem to think this is a good idea. Catherine Tanner, in uh, one of her more recent works, argues uh, emphasizes, quote, the plastic shape-shifting character of human nature, such that we have, quote, a nature that imitates God only by not having, one might say, a clearly delimited nature. So we are, quote, an incomprehensible image of the incomprehensible. Or from a different perspective, Thomas Carlson argues for an even more strongly apophatic vision of humanity in dialogue with Nicholas of Cusa, maintaining that the human is an indefinite creature who proves, quote, endlessly plastic, innovative, and endowed with potential, thinks precisely to its lack of fixed nature, essential definition, or lawful program. So how do we say these kinds of things, according to these theologians, without running into the three worries we identified? All right, the Gnostic worry. <clears throat> As I noted above, the Gnostic worry stems from the post-humanist idea that the future of humanity lies in overcoming the limitations of the material order. And the worry is that if we talk about the necessity of overcoming the limitations of the material order, we necessarily suggest that the material order is bad and are therefore getting into some kind of incipient Gnosticism. <clears throat> But what then do we do with the vision of someone like Gregory of Nyssa, who talks about what he calls the epic-static stretching of human nature in the eschatological experience of the resurrection? So the Gregory wants to say that in the resurrection, we have a body. Resurrection, Gregory of Nyssa doesn't deny the body. But what he wants to say is that as our humanity, including our bodies, are drawn up into the life of the Trinity, um, and we come to participate in the transformative reality that is the ongoing life of the Trinity, that our experiences um, are stretched beyond our imaginations. Well, that sure sounds a lot like overcoming many of the limitations of the material order. Now, Gregory of Nyssa will specifically talk about ways in which our bodies serve to uh, not just differentiate us, but divide us from one another. Uh, and so one of the goals for him in the resurrection is not overcoming the differentiation. Right? He doesn't want us to just kind of merge into the one, in a sense. We remain ourselves, but he wants to overcome that which divides us. So that as we're drawn up into the life of the Trinity, we're brought together in that intimate oneness that Jesus prays for in his high priestly prayer. And so he sees this epic static overcoming of the, uh, the limitations of the body as necessary for us to experience the corporate reality of being united in Christ through the power of the Spirit. But it begins to sound very much like Gregory's envisioning that we overcome at least some of the fundamental limitations of the body that we've had in mind. Even if we move beyond Gregory's understanding of the resurrection, uh, which sounds just weird to most people, myself included, and talk about slightly more mundane things, just think about the way that we often talk about Jesus' own resurrected body. I routinely hear Christians emphasize that after the resurrection, Jesus is, is able to pass through locked doors. And he's able to appear to the disciples where they don't recognize him at one moment and they do recognize him at another moment. And there are different ways of telling those stories and understanding what's at, at work there. But what I want to kind of camp out on is the idea that it doesn't seem to trouble our minds when we imagine that Jesus' resurrected body is capable of doing things that we generally think material bodies are not supposed to do. Right? I, I wonder sometimes if we've just grown up on too many of the same books and movies that I grew up on, so that when we hear about Jesus' resurrected body passing through a locked door, we're like, oh yeah, that kind of thing happens. No, it doesn't. Like, material bodies don't pass through other material bodies unless some type of radical change has taken place. We generally reserve the idea that something can pass through a material body for things like ghosts. And yet we routinely think about Jesus' material body as able to do those kinds of things, suggesting that his body has overcome the limitations of the material order. And yet we don't think that we have somehow lapsed into a kind of Gnosticism when we imagine Jesus' body to have been transformed in that kind of way. We do the same thing with time. Right? Pretty much every Christian theological system envisions the resurrection and the eternal life that we will experience in the eschatological state as overcoming 
what we now think of as kind of the natural temporal limitations of being a creature. Right? The fact that I'm a creature suggests I have a beginning, I'm going to have an end, this body's going to break down and die, every creaturely thing that we know of is temporally finite in that sense. And yet our eschatological imaginations have plenty of room for the idea that we will be embodied and yet not have a temporal end, which again suggests that we imagine the eschatology, uh, the, the resurrection to involve a kind of body that has transcended the limitations of the material order in a pretty fundamental way. And once again, we think we can do that without lapsing into some kind of incipient Gnosticism. So the question then becomes, why do we assume that another system that imagines, that we're to, they can, uh, uh, imagines a state in which we've overcome the limitations of the material order as inherently involving a kind of Gnosticism? To strengthen the worry further, then, it can't just be that they are envisioning this kind of mere overcoming of the limitations, li limitations of the material order, but maybe it's motivated improperly. So I think the real worry here for many of the theologians who critique post-humanism isn't what they say it is, overcoming the limitations of the material order. It's be they, because they think, or they at least imply, that lurking in the background, there's a denigration of the created order. Right? It's, it's kind of, you kind of get the sense of, like, I as a Christian theologian want to overcome the, the limitations of the material order, but it's okay for me to want to do that because I have like, good, godly, and gracious reasons for wanting to do that. When the post-humanist wants to do it, they must have some lurking, evil hatred of creation in mind. Uh, and to be fair to the theologians who are critiquing them, some of the post-humanists write in ways that suggest that's entirely possible. <clears throat> so when you're kind of working in this field, you always have to distinguish between particular post-humanists and kind of broader arguments that are involved here. Uh, I do think there are some post-humanists who do sound as though they have a deep suspicion and possibly hatred's really strong, but they really don't seem to like the material order. But for post-humanism as a whole and the kinds of arguments that they're using, it's not clear to me uh, that there is that suspicion of the created order that's lurking in the background. <clears throat> as a matter of fact, if you look at the arguments that many of them use, rather than starting their arguments from the presupposition that the body is inherently bad, most humanists actually begin by casting a vision of things that we actually think of as intrinsically good, right? Health, longevity, well-being, flourishing, uh, and then thinking that the body as currently constituted is a hindrance to achieving those greater goods. But of course, isn't that precisely what we're thinking when we talk about the fallen state of humanity in which we find ourselves and the necessity of the eschatological transformation of the body? that allows us to participate in the eschatological goods that we have in mind. A kind of intrinsic to, to, to the Christian story of salvation is that there are these eschatological goods that we long for, and yet we can't experience them fully. Not because of the, the, our materiality, but because the current constitution of our materiality in this fallen world prevents us from achieving those greater eschatological goods. And to be, do justice to the post-humanist arguments, there are a lot of similarities and commonalities there. An envisioning of a future good that is hindered by a current condition, so, and, and with the solution being that something needs to happen to that current condition to arrive at the future good. Now, that still leaves plenty of room to talk about whether their proposals for what we should do about our con current condition are the right kinds of proposals. Uh, and I should say at this point that in my, at least in this conversation, I'm intentionally bracketing out some fundamentally important questions about the practicalities involved in these conversations, specific technologies, environmental conditions, sociopolitical realities. There are all kinds of additional factors that we'd need to draw in here if we were to talk about a specific instance or a specific proposal of how to overcome a material limitation. I'm hanging out in the clouds up here. <clears throat> All right, so with that one, I just want to say their vision of the future seems to flow not from a hatred of the body for the most part, but from a commitment to a number of important goods, along with the conviction that the body, at least in its current state, prevents access to those goods. So let's move on to the second worry. I think we can follow a similar pattern here. At, uh, in other words, I'm not going to try to argue that Pelagianism is actually a good thing and we should adopt Pelagianism. 
here again, we want to tease out, is it possible that there are ways of thinking theologically that follow many of the contours of posthumanism, suggesting to us that maybe Pelagianism isn't the inevitable result? So remember here that the Pelagian worry arises because posthumanism envisions a future hope of salvation that is brought about by human effort. Yet I think it's rather important here, like I did the scare quotes when I said salvation there, intentionally. Because right, as a Christian theologian, I read about what the posthumanists have in mind for the state toward which we're moving. And even if I thought that was a good to achieve, right, ongoing life, um, lack of sickness, all those kinds of things, that's not salvation in any meaningfully Christian sense of the term. Nowhere in there do we have union with Christ through the power of the Spirit alongside the, the, the bride of Christ at the marriage feast of the Lamb, um, experiencing intimacy with one another eternally on worshiping and glorifying God. The, all of the things that are central and fundamental to the Christian doctrine of salvation are lacking in the postmodernist vision of the future. So at the very least, we'd want to say it can't qualify as Pelagianism. If we define Pelagianism as an attempt to achieve salvation, Christianly understood, because it isn't attempting to achieve salvation, Christianly understood. It's attempting to achieve a future state that it views as valuable on the basis of a set of, of goods and commitments to those goods. <clears throat> All right. So, oh, so reason number one that it can't be Pelagian is because it's not talking about salvation. Reason number two that it can't be Pelagian is even if it was talking about salvation, it's not obvious to me that there's something fundamentally problematic about saying that we should conduct our lives now on the basis of our understanding of what God will achieve in the eschatological future. America, I would suggest, along with most theologians, that that actually is the function of eschatology, rightly understood. Right? Eschatology isn't about kind of debates about what historical events may or may not take place in the future. Uh, so we can have interesting conversations about whether there are Black Hawk helicopters in the book of Revelation or whatnot. That fundamentally eschatology is about shaping our lives now in light of a vision of what God has in mind in the future. As a matter of fact, that is the very ethos that drove many of the early Christians to be involved in things like um, uh, the development of hospitals in the ancient world. Right? Because they had this idea that um, uh, health and well-being was a part of the eschatological end that God has in mind for human persons and that we should shape and conduct ourselves as Christians now in light of that future. Not because we think we can achieve it, right? as though if we build a bunch of hospitals and orphanages and do all the right kinds of things now, we will somehow kind of force God to bring about the eschatological state. That's not the idea. The idea being merely that if God's doing X, it would stand in line that he'd want us to do X-like things now, that we would be eschatologically shaped people, living according to the vision that God has given us about what it means to flourish as human persons eschatologically as we wait and anticipate that which God will be doing for us in the future. And yet, we think we can conduct ourselves that way without lapsing into a kind of Pelagianism. In many ways, that is what at least a kind of post-humanist thinking is. Right? A vision of the future on the basis of a set of goods that we largely agree with. Okay? Again, life, health, well-being. And then conducting ourselves now on the basis of that eschatological vision. Now, once again, lots of room for conversation about specific proposals. But the broad shape of the argument is remarkably similar, and yet we don't think of ourselves as Pelagian. All right, so let's skip down here to the definitional worry. <clears throat> the key here is to recognize that posthumanists aren't the only ones who can't figure out how to define what it means to be human. Right? Christians have long recognized that we actually struggle to provide significant and robust content for the meaning of what it means to be human. If I go back to the image of God piece, I mentioned earlier that even though we kind of know that there are lots of debates about what it means to be made in the image of God, that the idea of the image itself can provide kind of a, a, a central starting point for what it means to be human. But for many Christian theologians, that doesn't obviously follow then that we're able to provide a definition 
of what it means to be human. In the Eastern Orthodox tradition in particular, there's an emphasis on the idea that to be created in the image of God means that we are made in the image of an infinite and impossible to define being. So should it surprise us to find out that we ourselves are rather hard to figure out? Right? In that tradition, there's an inherent mysteriousness to the human person, specifically in virtue of the fact that we've been made in the image of God. So on that account, uh, even though th th that way of thinking about the image would agree that the image is central to thinking about what it means to be human, it's going to push against the idea that that then gets us to an ability to define what it means to be human beyond the fact that we're mysterious beings created to echo the mystery of an infinite God in the creaturely realm, which sounds great, but doesn't help a ton with the kinds of conversations that we're having here. I even found it intriguing. I was um, digging around in Aquinas a while ago, which I will admit I don't do on a regular basis. Uh, but Thomas Aquinas is somebody who would generally be viewed as friendly to the idea that we have a clear understanding of what it means to be human. Uh, Aquinas speaks quite confidently about what it means to be human and the kinds of properties and capacities that can be associated with being human. Uh, and yet, the Thomist tradition has this really interesting discussion about the kinds of transformations that creaturely things can and can't go through. And so there's this interesting discussion about uh, that there seems to be something interestingly different, let's say, about God making a donkey speak or a rock cry out versus, uh, in the Catholic tradition, God giving human persons the gift of beatific vision. Because right? on the one hand, you have a transformation of a thing so that it is suddenly capable of doing something that it was not obviously capable of doing beforehand. Right? Donkeys don't talk. Rocks clearly don't cry out. Right? So it's not like the rock has some hidden talking capacity that God taps into. Uh, and so suddenly we have like the rock getting a heightening of its communicative abilities. No, rocks don't talk. Uh, and so there's this transformation. Uh, it's almost a transformation against the nature of the rock. It's a kind of a radical uh, miracle. And in the Thomas tradition, they'll talk about that as the general obediential potency. You'll never need to know that. Uh, but the idea that basically God can do whatever he wants, that all creaturely things have the capacity to, uh, for God to transform them in weird and completely unexpected ways, irrespective of whatever capacities we have. Something like beatific vision, though, is different. Because the idea behind beatific vision is I don't have the intrinsic capacity. I can't make myself see God perfectly as he is in his own nature. I, not going to happen. But I do have the capacity to see and to know. So when God graciously elevates me to the supernatural ability to experience beatific vision, that's not against my nature. That's in accord with my nature. It's still gracious and supernatural because I'd never get there on my own. It's like no matter how hard I practice seeing and knowing things, I'm not going to eventually work my way up into beatific vision. So it is a gracious elevation of my capacities, but it's in accord with the nature that God has given me. And if you want to stick with the technical definitions, that the, that's the specific obediential potency as opposed to a general. Like it's, it, it's in accord with my nature. And it sounds great in a sense... But it's not clear to me how that kind of an account, which clearly kind of says there is an identifiable set of properties that I have as a human person, right, that lets me identify when a transformation is in accord with my properties and when a transformation is against my properties. So on that account, we might say something like beatific vision is in accord with, because I have the properties for rationality and sight, um, but let's say the, the property of suddenly being able to teleport myself wherever I want in the universe. Um, or the, the, uh, suddenly having the property of being um, multiply located in various places simultaneously. As far as I can tell, I don't have like, capacities that those would be heightenings of. Right? So that would sound like it's a general obediential potency. But being able to make the distinction requires me to be able to say what capacities I do and don't have that are in accord with. And it's not obvious to me how we pick out those kinds of differences. 
So say, for example, when Jesus walks on water. What are we dealing with here? Is it the case that that's a complete miraculous transformation so that Jesus is doing something humans aren't fundamentally, fundamentally are not capable of doing? Or is it the case that in Jesus suddenly we find out that human nature has a capacity or potentiality that we just didn't know we had until Jesus comes along and reveals it to us? Jesus walks through, again, locked doors. General obediential potency or specific obediential potency? So just claiming that there's a distinction, and actually there may well be a distinction, doesn't necessarily provide us with the resources for making the distinction or identifying those things that fall in one category or another. And yet it's precisely the ability to make the distinctions that seems necessary to engage the post-humanist vision. Because right? one of the criticisms of post-humanism is that they envision the kinds of transformations that go against human nature, like replacing organic parts in problematic ways with cybernetic parts um, or uploading my, mind to, uploading my mind to a machine or whatnot. Those are against nature. Um, uh, and they may very well be. It's just not obvious to me how that kind of distinction gives me the resources for making that kind of a fundamental claim. <clears throat> oh, and then lastly, I should say, probably the most common historically way of defining what it means to be human for Christians is quite simply, if you were born from a human, you are a human. Right, this kind of falls back into my growing up human isn't a terribly problematic thing. We don't spend a lot of our time worrying about um, if the baby in the hospital is a human. It's like, did it come out of a human? Then yeah, probably a human, and that's good enough for us. But the problem here being, it, um, not only are there questions of reproductive technology that are probably going to make that way of defining what it means to be human increasingly interesting moving forward, it's not clear how it's going to help with the posthumanist argument, because posthumanists actually aren't terribly bothered by where we started. They want to know where we're going. And so the fact that I was born from a human doesn't actually give me anything helpful in thinking about what kinds of transformations I can go through while remaining human. So on a variety of levels, when we think historically with the Christian tradition on how we define what it means to be human, we actually bump up against the definitional worry uh, based on at least a certain set of theological intuitions. Uh, that doesn't make the post-humanist right, uh, but it makes them a whole lot less lonely. All right, so now we've got here's plasticity, post-humanism. Here's one set of theological intuitions that says they're heretics. Here's one set of theological intuitions that says either they're not obviously heretics or we sound pretty heretical ourselves. And then really quickly, I want to wrap up with some stuff on human flourishing, and then let's talk about this a bit. <clears throat> we have four options on what to do with all of this that I won't take us through. Uh, your options are pretty much just to throw this whole paper away. That's one. Um, option two would be um, to agree that the, uh, the posthumanist argument leads to these three problematic conclusions and just say, all right, I'm going to be a Gnostic, a Pelagian, and a non-definitional person. Okay? So basically, it's option one is I'm wrong. Completely not worth discussing. Option two is the heresies aren't as bad as we thought they were. I'll let you pursue that option on your own time. Uh, option three would be the sets of Christian theological intuitions we raised in the third part of the paper aren't that important, so I will ignore them. Um, I'm not interested in pursuing that one because we have lots of Christians who have thought these were really important intuitions throughout time. So if you're on board with those three not being great ways of moving forward, then you've got to go with four, uh, which is um, defining what it means to be human in light of these ideas related to the plasticity of the human person is a more complicated task than we, th we thought it was. Uh, and that maybe we don't have clearly delineable ways of defining discreetly what it means to be human that would um, protect us in a way from having to engage these post-humanist arguments. <clears throat> that option comes with a price. And the price being, as I mentioned earlier, that we have long thought that uh, the ability to talk discreetly about what it means to be human is inseparably related to talk about what it means to flourish as a human person. So I have two daughters, a 13-year-old and a 17-year-old. Uh, I have raised my daughters intentionally or otherwise, oftentimes otherwise, according to some vision of what it means to be human and to flourish as a human person. Otherwise, I don't know, I would just be like arbitrarily and randomly doing stuff, like uh, trying to keep them alive. I hope I'm doing more than that, and doing more than that means I have some vision of what it means to be human, and that's defining, driving my understanding of what it means to flourish as a human person. 
when I engage in uh, youth ministry, like middle and high school students. I do that according to some vision of human flourishing, some understanding of what it means to be human that guides and directs the activities by which I seek to help these teenagers grow as human persons. If it's the case that I don't have the resources to give a discrete and delineable definition of what it means to be human, how in the world do I go about guiding young persons, guiding myself, guiding whoever toward any particular end because it doesn't seem like I have the ability to define the task in meaningful ways. <clears throat> All right. All this means that it becomes difficult to make a satisfying argument that looks something like, we know we should not do A because human nature is X, and A does not contribute to X. Right? And the reason that's problematic is we can't define X in that argument clearly enough to say whether or not we should or shouldn't do A. All right. I'm going to skip over some really interesting stuff that solves all these problems. And say, fortunately, though, we are not bereft of information, nor are we restricted to making rather abstract claims about defining what it means to be human. Instead, I want to suggest, albeit briefly here at the end, that we have an entire history of God working with humanity, one that begins with a creational story that sends clear messages about the kinds of things he has in mind, one that continues through the entire narrative of God working in and through Israel, one that climaxes in Jesus, continues through the church, and gestures, albeit tentatively, toward our final state. Such a history provides resources for understanding where the story is going and what constitutes fitting participation in the story of humanity, even if it doesn't necessarily provide resources for defining humanity in the discrete sorts of ways that we have traditionally thought possible. Discussions about human flourishing that proceed on this basis will rarely, if ever, be as straightforward as those grounded in clear definitions of human nature. Instead, they'll look more like this. Given the whole story of what God has been doing with humanity is preeminently revealed in Christ, it sure seems like A is a more fitting way of participating in that story than B. To some ears, that sounds overly subjective. Yet many of those who've been involved in Christian ethics know that some have argued this is precisely how Christians should make moral decisions in general. So maybe it's time for us to apply a similar form of reasoning to decisions we make about what it means to be human and how to flourish as human persons. At least according to the argument presented here that you, of course, are all going to talk me out of, but in the discussion time, that seems to be the case if we're going to continue to talk about what it means to be human in an age of plasticity. So that's it. That's all I got for you. <laughs>